Good morning and a warm welcome to Tuesday's programme. Now, yesterday we had a great response to our appeal to identify those men who had lost their lives on the train network. Lots of names and leads for the detectives to follow up on there. And, of course, we'll let you know how all of that goes. This morning, how a brave whistleblower exposes the cruel and shocking story of nurses illegally drugging their patients on a hospital ward. They were putting people's lives in danger. The risk was immense and we had to do something to stop it. And 50 years ago, mother of three, Isabella Skelton, disappeared without a trace. Today, her daughter is in the studio and is convinced her mother didn't walk out on her and her siblings. And the writer behind BBC One's hit cop drama, The Responder, joins us in the studio to tell us how his time as a first responder himself inspired the TV series. All of our guests and officers will be here throughout the programme along with our team who are standing by the phones ready to take your calls. To get in touch, you can scan the QR code below using your phone's camera. That'll take you through to our homepage. Otherwise, the number to ring or WhatsApp a message to is 08000 468 or you can text the word CRIME to 63399, leave a space and then write your message, or if you prefer, you can email us. That's the address there at cwl at bbc.co.uk. First this morning, you might remember this face. It belongs to a man called Nick Hughes, who we have appealed for information on before. Well, we had dozens of calls about him, with sightings from all over the UK, but it's not been enough to stop him, as you're about to hear. He's a prolific thief. There could be many victims. So he needs to be arrested. I go to my gym twice a week, which is great at my age, you know, when things can get sort of creaky. In September last year, retired magistrate Phil Burns visited the gym at Nuffield Health Centre in Chichester. I saw a chap come along and he sat down next to a pile of clothes. I just got a feeling he just, he was too close to me. And it did make me feel somewhat uncomfortable. Phil put his belongings in a locker. I put in my coat to lock the locker he was sitting behind me, and then I went upstairs to start my session. Phil spent an hour in the gym. When he came back to the changing rooms, nothing seemed out of place. When I got changed, I put my hand in a pocket, found my wallet, and then noticed that a number of cards were missing. I realised it must have been that chap who was seeing behind me, and he must have seen the code I put in. Phil got straight on the phone to his bank, but it was too late. My card had been used within that hour in numerous shops. The thief didn't have access to Phil's PIN codes, but he was able to pay using the card's contactless option. Although Phil had a fixed limit on these, the man carried out a swift spending spree. He had bought gift cards. He had placed a bet in the local betting shop. He went to a foreign exchange shop and bought some foreign currency. The thief managed to spend £600 on two of Phil's bank cards. It's just anger you feel that someone could have perpetrated this crime against you. Two months later, near Chichester, a man and his son were on their way to the pool at the Goodwood Health Club. He's entered the changing rooms and he was followed in by a male. The male sat very close to him, too close. The victim actually states he found this situation quite menacing and he was a little bit concerned, but he didn't want a confrontation. So he's ended up putting his bag in a locker, unlocking the locker, then leaving the changing rooms to go for a swim.
They spent an hour in the pool before returning to find their locker had been forced open. He's immediately concerned because he realises that his bag with its contents have been stolen. Inside the bag, bank cards are missing, driving licence, several sets of car keys, mobile phone. Using the Find My Phone feature, the mobile was traced to a bank in Chichester. The thief had used personal information found on the victim's driving licence to guess the code on his mobile phone. With that unlocked, he was able to access the victim's banking app, where he could see the victim's credit card pin. The thief used that to make a number of withdrawals and purchases from two accounts, taking £4,500. His car keys have been stolen. Two vehicles have had to have the locking systems replaced. It's cost a great inconvenience to our victim. The total loss for our victim that day, we're talking approximately £20,000. Police had no shortage of CCTV to work from. We've got good CCTV that clearly shows a suspect going into the Nuffield Sports Facility before the first crime. We've then got good CCTV that shows him actually doing fraudulent transactions after he's left the sports facility. On this occasion, he got away with just under £100 worth of money. And also a betting shop. He can clearly be seen using the stolen cards or he's made a bet for £100. He's popped into a local food premises where he's bought his lunch. The second incident showed an almost identical pattern of behaviour. He's gone to the same travel agents that he went to in the previous events in September. He's conducted two transactions that took place over just a few minutes, where he's obtained just under a thousand pounds in euros. Investigators were in no doubt the same man was responsible for both thefts, but needed a name. At the health club, he'd used a fake membership card, but on it was a real photo. The best image we had is photograph from his membership card at the sports centre. And from this image, we were able to make a positive ID. The photo matched one found on the police national database of a man wanted in connection with a number of similar offences. We positively identified the suspect to be Nicholas Hughes. Nicholas Hughes remains a wanted man. The son, he was there when his dad has found out about the theft. This has greatly affected him. The family have got big concerns about being burgled. You become suspicious of anybody. You feel very vulnerable, and it takes a long time to get over that, and in fact, you probably never do. My greatest concern is that this individual has not been caught, and I think the sooner the police apprehend this individual, the better. We understand that some of our viewers in Wales may have experienced a technical issue at the start of the show. Hopefully that won't happen again. Paul Somerville from the North Yorkshire Police Force Intelligence Bureau is back with us here in the studio, though. Um, Paul, can you just remind us of those recent developments that have happened in the south of the country with this cat and mouse chase that's going on at the moment with yeah. this man? Yeah, as you can see, he continues to re-offend. Um, and I've been in touch with Bob, who you've seen on the video as well. These offences were in, in Sussex, Goodwood and Chichester. Exactly the same MO as is used on previous offences, into the gymnasiums, uh, into the lockers and he's stolen cash, bank cards, etc. Mm. Yeah, lots and lots that he's stolen there. Now, when you were last on, I know you got a good response from the viewers. Did that lead to anything positive in terms of the investigation? Yeah, we got an excellent response. Um, there were a couple of calls that were interesting. One lady called Amanda. She rang from um, Scotland and she thought she'd seen him in a hotel gym in Scotland. My colleagues in Scotland checked it out. Unfortunately, that came to nothing. And another lady as well, um, she rang in and said that she'd actually employed him as a gardener 
about 25 years ago. Um, and she used to call him Monsieur Monsieur Nicolas. That's could how she called him. There was a slight French connection yeah, somewhere in it all, yeah, but as somewhere. well. Yeah, it could be uh, significant, though. It's, it's very interesting, nonetheless. OK, take us back to the start of this, then, when the first report came in on the 28th of January 2020. That's right. I was first alerted by colleagues from Skipton who asked me to look into it, and it was the um, Coniston Hall Hotel. Again, um, a man had gone into the changing rooms and he'd um, spotted um, a man putting the stuff in his locker, mm -hmm. used his combination lock whilst he was in the gym, and then stole his bank cards, driving licence and cash, and they were used fraudulently just a little bit later on in Skipton and Ilkley. OK, and it wasn't long after, just a couple of weeks later, that another very similar offence occurred? Exactly. Two weeks later, um, in February, at the Woodhall Hotel, that's between Harrogate and Weatherby as well, exactly the same MO, into the changing room of the local gym. Um, and again, the locker was opened mm -hmm. and the money, cards and um, driving licence were stolen from there as well. I mean, he moves around a lot, doesn't he? We've got reports here from your own force area, of course. No. In Yorkshire, we've got Cumbria, Durham, Lancashire, <clears throat> Cheshire. Now we've just heard from Sussex as well. Is the MO, the way he operates, the same? It is, more or less. Now, we know he uses the trains uh, and he uses taxis as well from okay. the train station. We know that. We've, um, we've interviewed uh, taxi drivers that said they've dropped him off. So the MO is exactly the same. He does wear a disguise, as you can see on some of these pictures. Yeah, so we just saw an image and we're seeing some moving footage here, but again, he's got a, a different style of hat on. And this is something he, he often wears a hat, you've noticed. He does indeed, yeah. Either it be a baseball cap or a flat cap. He, he sometimes uses glasses. And as you can see in this video, this was just after the pandemic and he used a mask as well to hide his face. OK, uh, we're going to talk through the rest of the description of him because we do need to find out where this man is at the moment. Talk us through what he looks like. Well, he's originally from Coventry. Mm -hmm. He does speak with a mild um, Brummie accent. He's about five foot ten tall. He's quite a sort of rotund man. He is aged 50, 51, and he does have this grey, stubbly beard um, and moustache and sideburns as well. OK, now we've mentioned it that he often wears a hat or some sort of head covering. <clears throat> However, there was that occasion when he didn't. This is that image there, and this is yeah. great, isn't it? Because he hasn't got that. We, he hasn't got anything covering his face. So we really urge our viewers to, to see if they've seen this person around. Exactly, yeah. If you've seen him, um, he could be on the train, he could be in a gym, he could be in a shop, he could be even in a betting shop, because we do know he likes gambling as well. OK, now, and, and it's worth saying at this point, if our, if our viewers are watching this and they're concerned, they should probably cover their pins. That's a good idea to do, just in case anyone is watching over your shoulder. We know how we believe this man has operated. Others may want to do the same, and that's good advice. Exactly, yeah. If you do have to take your valuables into the gymnasium and into the changing room and the lockers, please ensure, please be extra vigilant that you, you're not overlooked by anyone at all. Anything suspicious as well, please report it to the management and the police. Great advice. Thank you, Paul. Have a, have a look at that range of images of him. Remember, he speaks with a Coventry accent, around about 5'10 tall, stocky build, and often, as we say, wears a baseball cap or similar. If you've seen him, pick up the phone and call. The contact details are on the screen at the bottom by the clock. Still to come, we're hearing about the work of a hostage and crisis negotiator who's trained the FBI. The negotiator just brings a different perspective. When you've been part of saving somebody's life and nobody's injured and nobody's died, that's an amazing feeling. It's the best feeling in the world. But first, 55 years ago, mother of three, Isabella Skelton, disappeared one day from a home in Manchester and has never been seen since. Today, we're joined by her daughter, Linda, and Martin Bottomley from the GMP Cold Case Unit. Thank you to both of you for, for coming in you. Um, this morning. Linda, you were just 14 years old when your mum disappeared. Can, can we start by you just telling us a, a bit more uh, about her? Yes. Um, she was born on the 21st of January, 1934. She lived in Anderson, an area of Glasgow, with her family. And then, obviously, married, children. And then we moved down from the Glasgow area to Salford. Uh, Mum and Dad, two brothers. And, you know, just normal family life. And um, you were close to your mum, weren't you? Yes, she was a typical mum, I would say. 
as yeah. far as I'm aware these yeah. days. Uh, but yeah, um, she went to work. She was a typist office person mm. and um, she looked after the house. Uh, my dad was um, a lorry driver for a catalogue firm and it was just a normal run of the house, work Monday to Friday yeah. and things like that. And he went to school. And reflecting on your mum's disappearance, this happened two weeks before your 15th birthday, wasn't it? It was the 6th of June. Yes, my birthday was the 18th of June. And uh, I mean, reflecting on that now, what, what's going through your mind? I guess it's been a process of trying to come to terms or understanding what, what happened. Well, in the beginning, it sounds selfish. I was surprised that she'd left before my birthday. I didn't mm. think that sounds selfish, but I don't mean it that way. Um, I was just told there was just my dad and myself that day, and he just told me that she'd gone to work away. Um, but two brothers weren't there. And then that was basically it. I didn't see my mum that day. And that was back in 1969, yes. wasn't it? As we it said, was a 55 Friday. years ago, on a Friday. Yes. Um, what have you made of your mum's disappearance as, as time has, has passed? Have you tried to find out more? Um, I started in 1978 to look for my mum. My husband and myself, we went to Glasgow, um, tried the electro rolls, telephone calls, long lost families. Um, my daughter even wrote Concealer Black. She was here in those days. Yeah. Um, and we just did that, you know, to see if we could get. Then we kept coming back, nothing happened. So we kept pushing and pushing mm. for different things. And then um, we became aware of these missing persons and beyond in Glasgow. And they have done an amazing thing for searching and helping us, as well as everybody else, the police and everything else. I'm not disputing that. Mm. Uh, but the more the dig, the better it was for us. Yeah. So it was just a case. And we've come to a, a dead end, really. What's the whole process been, been like for you, Linda, and the family? It, it's horrible. I mean, my, my first um, instinct was when I had my own children. Mm. And you need a mother. <laughs> you know, everybody needs a mother, but mm. especially when you've had your own children. Yeah. So I find, found that traumatic because I didn't have that, you know. Yeah. I had a mother-in-law, but obviously she died not long after mm. my first child was born. Let, let me bring Martin Bottomley in here because you started working on this case back in 2019 to try and find some answers for, for Linda. Um, tell us a bit more about what information you have. Yeah, that's what it's all about, really, trying to find answers. I mean, you can see how upset Linda and all her family are. Uh, and there's been no physical sign of Isabella, then no digital sign either. You know, she's never had a hospital appointment, never applied for a driving licence, um, never drawn a pension. So once we, we learn those kind of things, a missing persons inquiry becomes a criminal investigation. Mm. And we did receive some information a couple of years ago about where... Uh, some ground had been disturbed in an old property in North Manchester where the family had once lived. So we, we excavated both the garden uh, and the cellar uh, for a period of 12 weeks, actually, but there was no sign of, uh, of Isabella there. No. And obviously we're still on the search to get Linda some answers. Of course. Now, Linda, there was one possible sighting, wasn't there? So we believe... Um, it it was some, I don't know where the conversation came from. We got a telephone call, not us, I think it was my father, got a telephone call to say that somebody had seen her in Buchanan Street, which is in Glasgow. And at the time, my father's brother was still alive. So we phoned him and he went to Buchanan Street and he said there was nothing there. But obviously he's dead, so he can't confirm yeah. that. Is it, is it possible, Martin, that, that Isabella may have changed her identity? It, it's entirely possible, but I think after all this time and all the, the searching, uh, it's very unlikely. Mm. So, so how can the public watching this morning help? What information do you need? We really need to hear from anybody who knew Isabella uh, when she was living in Crumpson in North Manchester or seen her since, obviously. Uh, perhaps she's moved on to Glasgow, who knows, and assumed another identity, but I do think that's unlikely. Mm. But, you know, you may have been working with her at uh, Gallagher's a cigarette factory or at Atlas Express Couriers or at Bearing Services, all firms in North Manchester or Salford that she worked at during that time. Yeah. So if you've heard from her, if you've seen her, if you know anything about her dis disappearance, please get in touch. 
And Linda, just finally, I'm sure you'd echo everything that Martin said there, appealing to our viewers at home, if they have any information about your mum to come forward. Yeah, please, anything. It's surprising if somebody knows, knows a little bit about something, they might not even thought about it in the past, but hopefully, they, you know, they can find some way of getting it across. Absolutely. Really appreciate you coming in I today. I appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Well, if you recognise this image or know anything about this case, then please do get in touch. Our details are on the screen just down by the clock. Now we're off to Blackpool to hear how the suspicions of a student nurse led to the discovery of a ring of healthcare professionals doing the unthinkable. They were putting people's lives in danger. The risk was immense and we had to do something to stop it. My mum was, uh, <laughs> she was funny. She loved me kids and my dad. And she was just a fun loving mum. In later life, Janet Westhead developed Alzheimer's and in February 2017, suffered a mini stroke. She was admitted to Blackpool Victoria Hospital's stroke unit. Initially, she seemed to be recovering well. She was talking to the lady across the bed, having a laugh and a joke. She had movement in her left side and that was, it was coming back, so she was quite happy with that. But as Janet remained in hospital, her family noticed worrying changes. Well, I wondered why my mum was so anxious and screaming and seeing things that she shouldn't have been, like the devil and spiders crawling up the wall. And I was very concerned about this and I asked, what they had given her to make her like that, which I've got replied, Zopiclone. Zopiclone is a sleeping pill used for short-term treatment of insomnia. Susan was worried what impact it might have on her mother's dementia. Because my mum had Alzheimer's, I sat up all night looking at what Zopiclone can do to you. So I sat there and wrote a letter to the Trust regarding why my mother was given Zopiclone. I was very concerned about the way they were treating her, what they were giving her, and how much she had deteriorated in a few weeks. I wasn't getting any answers. Who prescribed these drugs to my mum? When Janet was discharged in May 2017, she was so frail, she had to be cared for in a nursing home. She died seven months later, aged 80. The following year, a student nurse was put on shift with a senior staff nurse, Catherine Hudson, who was responsible for the running of the stroke unit. Her colleagues described her as being a confident, competent nurse, a big character, uh, somebody who would like to get her own way. But what the student nurse witnessed concerned her. They were doing their nighttime medication rounds and they were with one particular patient who had suffered a stroke. At that point, she produced a Zopiclone tablet out of her uniform pocket. She then went on to give the tablet to the patient. The student nurse knew this was wrong and asked her why she was doing that when it was not prescribed. Catherine Hudson replied to say that, well, really, you don't need to worry about it. She's not for resuscitation, this patient, and if she were to die, there'd be no post-mortem. This alarming response wasn't the only red flag about Catherine Hudson's behaviour. The student nurse heard her speak about withholding medication from patients, particularly laxatives. And the reason for that was so that she didn't have to clean up after them during the shift. 
Alarmed at what she saw, the student nurse turned whistleblower, and DCI Riley and her team were alerted. Catherine Hudson was arrested the following morning before she was able to go to work, and we conducted a search at her home address, recovering drugs that we believed were stolen from the hospital and a number of items, including her mobile phone. When officers reviewed text messages found on the phone, they were stunned. The messages suggested Catherine Hudson had been routinely sedating patients simply to control their behaviour. There was a whole raft of messages that had been exchanged between Catherine Hudson and other members of nursing staff on the stroke unit who she worked with, and these went back many, many years. DCI Riley and her team realised they had to move fast to prevent patients being given drugs they hadn't been prescribed. It was clear that the view of the patients and the contempt that Catherine Hudson had for her patients was shared wider than just herself. The types of messages she was sending and receiving were in respect of patients, not calling them by their names, often using bed numbers or derogatory nicknames, and speaking of them in quite despicable terms. They were really upsetting to read. And the evidence suggested that Catherine Hudson was receiving support from a colleague. Charlotte Wilmot at the time, she was a nursing practitioner and worked on the stroke unit. There was evidence that Charlotte Wilmot was actively encouraging Catherine Hudson to unlawfully sedate patients. She was arrested. Investigators then had to establish if the patients mentioned in the text had suffered. To help us to do that, we needed to seize the medical notes from the hospital relating to those patients. And each one of those medical notes was reviewed to look for any evidence of unexpected drowsiness, patients that couldn't be roused, were there any patterns of behavior after the shifts that Catherine Hudson and Charlotte Wilmot had worked that were particularly of interest to the inquiry. Most of these patients have sadly died since the investigation had begun. So not only were these families grieving for their loved ones that they'd lost, we were then visiting them to tell them that we suspected your loved one might have been a victim of ill treatment and may have been drugged whilst they were on the stroke unit. Susan Miller was contacted about her mum, Janet. When I spoke to the police, I told them about what had happened to my mum, what drugs they were given to her what they had done to her. My mum wasn't my mum anymore. She was this poor old woman that had to go in a nursing home because she couldn't look after herself anymore. During the five-year investigation, police reviewed the care of more than 100 patients. Most of their families told detectives that they suspected something was amiss with their loved one's treatment. Some of the patients had told families that they were being drugged and when families had spoken to the nursing staff about this, they were reassured that clearly that wasn't the case and that actually they were confused. And as anyone would, they trusted what they were being told by the nursing staff. In October 2023, Catherine Hudson was found guilty of three counts of ill treatment and one count of conspiracy to ill treat. Charlotte Wilmot was found guilty of conspiracy to ill treat and encouraging Hudson to sedate a patient. Hudson was sentenced to seven years and two months in prison, and Wilmot sentenced to three years. Catherine Hudson would take some degree of delight in seeing patients suffer. To do that, in my mind, is truly evil. I cannot believe that them and any other person could treat people like this you know, inhumane. It was just, just horrible what they'd done. It breaks my heart. Well, we asked the Trust about that case and they said it was shocking and deeply upsetting. The sentencing of Hudson and Wilmot brought to a conclusion proceedings for all those involved. They apologise for the suffering these women's actions caused and say everyone should be assured that they employ thousands of staff who are caring and compassionate.
They've reviewed both the way they classify drugs and their patient relations team. They also commended the actions of the whistleblower, whose concerns they say were promptly reported to police, illustrating the hospital's ongoing commitment to encourage staff to speak up. Now, our next guest is a copper turned TV writer who used his real life experiences in policing on the front line to write a BBC smash hit. Before we chat to writer and executive producer of The Responder, Tony Schumacher, let's take a look at a clip from the last series. It's such important work. Mm -hmm. Is it? I don't think it is. I think it's whack-a-mole. Except the moles were trackies. Tony, so it's so good to have you in the studio. Rav and I are massive fans Huge of you. Huge fans. And the Go Responder. <laughs> <laughs> We're loving this. Definitely isn't it? <laughs> but the reception has been incredible, hasn't it? You must be over the moon. Mate, I cannot believe the way it's took off. We literally, we just thought we were going to be like this little Stuart Little, you know, on BBC mm. Two, hidden away after news nights. And it, we went global. Yeah. It's crazy, you know, Freeman, like, sold the show and it just did really well, you know. Worldwide. Well, thank you. Good yeah, for yeah. you. But you've got a lot of experience and a lot of that has come from the police. So tell yeah. us about your time in the police as a cop. Well, um, oh, God. Uh, how long have you got? It was... Um, I basically... Uh, I worked as response. It's a yeah. funny thing for me, because I, I never really wanted to be a copy. You know, look at me, I'm gorgeous. Look at me. Oh, <laughs> well, you. Yeah. Still are, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what being in a police does, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I joined and um, I... Uh, I worked response, basically, my entire career, but I never wanted to be a copper. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely loved it to start with. Mm -hmm. But then I think as time went on, it kind of just burnt me out more than anything, mm -hmm. you know? And you don't notice it happening until afterwards. Yeah. Um, and this is the result. <laughs> but this is the thing with the drama. It very much reflects those mental struggles that officers can face when they're on the job. And I'm sure for you writing that, you were able to really resonate with with that plot. I mean that, that that's why I wanted to write it you know it's not just Bobby's it's it's anyone who works in the emergency services really We're, everyone it's takes such a toll you know mm. you, you the, the guys who come on the show you know and talk to you the men and women who, who, who are out there doing the job now oh god you know it makes you feel so humble like looking at, at what they're dealing with and they're taking it home yeah constantly going home constantly carrying it around with them you know so for me it was a little bit of therapy really writing the show to oh. be honest with you my next one's about the trauma a writer goes through <laughs> <laughs> yeah but Tony it is, it is a hard job on the on the front I mean something I've done yeah. we've both done it together but we've done it a few years ago do you yeah. think the chat around mental health now in the forces is, is better in a better place than where it was yeah I, I definitely think it's improved i mean it, it you know for instance look, merseyside police asked me in um to talk to recruits i always really? i've always got to be careful i say talk to recruits just in case it sounds like i've been summoned for something but uh, <laughs> yeah they asked me in to talk to recruits about mental health and and how to deal with things and how not to deal with things really with me um so you know that was not a conversation that was happening when i was in the job no. you know and it's great to see that you know, because obviously, if you want value for money from, you, from your staff, look after them, make sure Absolutely. they're happy, make sure they stay, Absolutely. you know. And you can speak so powerfully about those experiences. You went through some really tough times. Yeah, you? God, yeah, yeah. I mean, it broke me, the job. I ended up, like, living in my car with a dog, you know. Mm. It's um, it's crazy the, the toll it took on me, you know. Um, but you managed to get back on your feet, didn't you, with the help of, of some friends along yeah, the no, way? Yeah, no, my best mate reached out to me. It was crazy. He found out I was living... Because one of the things is, and, and you know... What I always like to, to think is that by talking about it, it'll make other people feel comfortable about mm. talking about it. Mm -hmm. Because I was too embarrassed. It was crazy. I was too embarrassed to say I'm living in my car. Yeah. So a mate of mine found out, um, come looking for me, and um, Teddy, you know, gave me money to rent a place to live, oh, and I got wow. back on my feet, and that was that. But, you know? but there were yeah. obviously some, some tough times that you've gone through, and, and was that something that helped you actually write this brilliant uh, drama? You know, I, I'm not suggesting anyone goes out and has a nervous breakdown, but it definitely helped me. Something flicked in my head, and I'll never know what it was. I don't know, uh, you know, how it happened. I'd always wanted to be a writer as a kid. Mm -hmm. No idea how to do it, but that breakdown got me to that point, you know? Crazy. It's, it's amazing just reflecting on it all now. Where you are now. I, I, I've got to ask, when's Series 2 happening? Well, Great question! Oh, no, 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 yeah, 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 it's a good question. I keep asking myself. No, it, it, we're hoping to be the end of May. We're looking at the end of May. That's not long. Uh, yeah, no, it isn't. Yeah, God, terrifying. I know, I know. Amazing. I better write it. 
you've got, yeah, yeah, you better get on Fantastic. with it. Get back it's home, Tony, and get right in. Great series. <laughs> it really is. Thank, Thank you, Thank you so much. much for joining us. Thanks, Tony. Now, some of the situations the officer in our next film found herself in do read like TV really scripts. Do. It's uh, Nikki Perfect, one of the UK's leading police negotiators. When you've been part of saving somebody's life and nobody's injured and nobody's died, that's an amazing feeling. It's the best feeling in the world. I'm Nikki Perfect. I was a Metropolitan Hostage and Crisis Negotiator for a decade, and I've been involved in numerous negotiations throughout my career. I think people have a perception of police negotiators based on films. This isn't necessarily a true reflection of what it's actually like to be a police hostage and crisis negotiator. The negotiator just brings a different perspective, and their overarching role is to save life everybody's life. And most police negotiators in the UK do it on top of their day job. Every time that phone rang, and it didn't matter what time in the morning or afternoon or evening it was, I knew that it would be a chance to make a difference. When you're able to see the world through another lens, through somebody else's perspective, that's when you're able to build relationships. That's when the other person recognises that you are doing your best to listen and try and find out what's happening to them. And then you're able to build trust with people and then that will help you to influence and persuade an action for them to take or not to take. So my first call out I remember very well. It's a young man who's just been released from prison. He's gone round to his ex-partner's house. They have a young child that he's never seen before. The child was just two to three months old. They've had a emotional conversation. She's alleging that he has assaulted her, but he's taken the child without her consent. There's been a car chase around South London and the car is now surrounded by police officers. So yeah, there's a real concern for the child's welfare. We made a decision that we would persuade him to put the child on the seat and ask him to reach out of the car to grab some bits and pieces. And as he did that, he was surrounded by police officers and he was tasered. Thankfully, the child was saved and he was okay as well. For me, in every negotiation, it's important to look at the lessons learned so that you can then take them forward to your next one. One of the incidents I dealt with was a lady on top of a car park and she was thinking about ending her life that day. She was hanging off the side edge of the car park and our biggest concern was not whether she was going to necessarily jump, but whether she was going to fall. She told us that she had an argument with her boyfriend, that she started drinking again, and she was worried that he was going to leave her because she had promised him that she would never drink again. We worked with him to speak to her, and they had a conversation, and with us helped her to be persuaded to come down off the edge. The sense of relief in knowing that you've done that good job and that nobody's been injured and no one's died that day is amazing. So in 2012, my career evolved a little bit more in the negotiation world. So I became an international hostage and crisis negotiator. Now I was also involved in kidnaps, where there was an international incident and British citizens were either caught up in a kidnap or a terrorist incident, like ISIS. So in 2018, I retired from policing. From working into my role as a negotiator, I've learned three really powerful lessons. One is we all have a story. Two is we will all have a crisis at some stage in our life. And the third one is that loneliness is one of the biggest killers in the UK. I've realised how powerful conversations are and they really can change or make a difference to somebody else's life. Wow, what an amazing woman. Time now to have a look and see who's made today's Wanted Faces Gallery. And first, we've got Daniel Huney. Northamptonshire police have charged him with possession with intent to supply drugs, but since then, he's disappeared. Originally from Albania, he's 29 years old with black hair, light grey-blue eyes and a dark beard. Next, we have Mohamed Bouali. City of London police have charged him with infringing trademark rules and drugs offences, but he absconded before his court date. He's Moroccan, 33 years old, of average build with dark hair and a beard. Police say he has links to London, Manchester and France. And intelligence actually suggests he was in Paris at some point last year. This here is Thomas Stephen Sabato. 
He's been recalled to prison after breaching the strict conditions attached to his release. He's 35, six foot tall, with dark brown hair and green eyes. He often wears an earring in both ears. Origi from Cannes in France, he's said to have connections in Blackpool and Lytham St Anne's in Lancashire, as well as to Manchester and also Liverpool. And last for this morning is Leon Wells, although he also sometimes uses the surnames Humphreys and Stretch. He's been recalled to prison after breaching the conditions of his licence. He's 41, speaks with a Welsh accent and has dark hair and stubble. And police believe he has links across South Wales as well as to other European, Middle Eastern and Asian countries. If you recognise any of these men or know their whereabouts, please do get in touch. The number to call is on the screen below. Just to let you know, we've had loads of calls about Nick Hughes, so thank you so much for those. And we've just got time to bring you a quick update on an appeal from October 2023. We were asking for information on the whereabouts of 35-year-old Darren Oldham. Originally from Banbury in Oxfordshire, police in South Yorkshire wanted to question him in connection to a serious sexual assault of a 14-year-old. A few months later, he sexually assaulted another 14-year-old girl near a beach in Cornwall after giving her cannabis and alcohol. Oldham was arrested by police a month later in November 2023. He was charged with two counts of assault against two females, both of whom were under 16 at the time of the offences. In January this year, he pleaded guilty to the charges at Sheffield Crown Court and was sentenced to nine years in prison with an extended licence period of three years. He was also made the subject of a restraining order prohibiting him from contacting one of those victims. Investigating officer PC Adam Jones said Darren Oldham took advantage of two vulnerable children and I'm pleased he will now serve time in prison. Justice for the victims would not have been possible without their commendable bravery and courage. A really good result there. Now, if you missed any of our series so far, you can catch us on iPlayer for up to seven days after broadcast. Tomorrow, the parents of Adam Chadwick, who was fatally shot in 2008, are talking to us, pleading for information on who killed their son. You expect the person who oh, shot Adam, you expected him to be in custody, charged and sent to jail. We're still waiting for that justice now. In the meantime, we'll leave you with another look at our wanted faces. If you have any information at all, just use the contact details and you can head to our website. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow, same time of 10.45. Bye for now.